is the fourth Sunday of the Easter season, and this morning we are considering John's Gospel, the 21st chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, Follow me. This little scriptural vignette is often connected to Peter's denial of Jesus. Peter, the, the rock, bold Peter who claimed he would willingly die with Jesus if he had to, denied his friend, teacher, and Lord three times in the face of a servant girl's question. Much is often made of the fact that Peter denied Jesus three times, and Jesus asks Peter three times, much to Peter's chagrin, if he loves Jesus. In fact, this passage is often referred to as the reinstatement of Peter, as if Somehow Peter had disqualified himself from being a disciple by his actions while Jesus was before Pilate. Of course, nowhere do we read that Jesus, or God the Father, said to Peter, because of what you have done, or because of your lack of courage, you're out. So if, in fact, Peter was somehow disqualified, rendered unfit for ministry, as it were, then he did it to himself, through his own feelings of guilt and remorse. I can imagine it must have been supremely difficult for Peter. It would have been difficult enough if Jesus had truly remained in death's prison. But now that Jesus was alive, risen just as he said, Peter's sublime joy surely must have been marred by his realization of his own shortcomings. But then, how different was Peter than any of the others? It seems that with the exception of John, all of the men fled, fearing for their lives. And how different is Peter than us, when we have been at times confronted with spiritual challenge? Have we retreated into ourselves, fearing, if not for our safety, then for our self-image or our social standing? Have we in some ways denied Christ in the face of the world? And do our feelings of remorse somehow disqualify us from further serving Jesus? It's not really the main point that I want to make this morning, but since I've sort of stumbled across it, I will state again that Jesus never rejects Peter, even when Peter denies him. But it's possible that Peter may have felt rejected, felt worthless in the sight of his risen Lord, as we sometimes can when we look at our own shortcomings. And yet it is not God rejecting us, but our own emotional state that creates the perceived rift. For God is always forgiving. Jesus proved that on the cross. 
We humans, however, it seems, are less so, even when dealing with ourselves. But Jesus does come to Peter specifically. He'd already interacted with all the disciples, and even Peter. Why, in fact, verse 7 of John 21 tells us that it was Peter who recognized Jesus standing on the shore and jumps out of the fishing boat to meet him. So if Peter was feeling dejected and weighted down by guilt, he nonetheless must have been pretty certain that Jesus, one way or another, would receive him. And that brings us to this morning's text. One can imagine the wonderful meal that Jesus has with his disciples, that glorious catch of fish. If only we could know what they spoke of. On the other hand, perhaps they said very little, all still too in awe, still too overjoyed that it was all real, just as Jesus had said. And then Jesus takes Peter aside. It may be our own experience of guilt that causes us to imagine Peter thinking, uh-oh, here it comes. We don't really know what Peter was thinking at all, truth be told. But I doubt very much he was expecting what came next. Peter, do you love me? What's more, do you love me more than these? Uh, now the text, at least as we read it in English, is rather ambiguous about what the these of more than these means. While many commentators have suggested Jesus is asking Peter if Peter loves Jesus more than the other disciples do, and still other commentators believe that Jesus is asking Peter if he loves him more than he loves the other disciples. I am inclined to sign with Dr. Harold Greenlee, who in his 2005 article for the Journal of Translation states that, linguistically, it makes the most sense that Jesus was referring to the accoutrements of Peter's life as a fisherman. Do you love me more than your nets and other gear, more than your fishing boat, and more than that enormous catch of fish you just dragged in? In short, Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me more than you love your old life? Now, there are at least four words the authors of John could have used to describe what Jesus was asking Peter. Agape, Eros, Philia, and Storge. John records, of course, Agape, a sacrificial love. The kind of love, in fact, that Jesus has for his disciples, or God the Father has for the world. So Jesus was effectively asking, Peter, do you love me the way that I love you. What's interesting is that Peter replies with a different word. Instead of using the word agape, as Jesus had done, Peter responds with philia, brotherly love. And this happens a second time. Jesus again asks Peter, do you love me? Using the word agape, and Peter again responds with philia. Uh, another third time. The third time is different. Jesus asks not about agape, but uses Peter's word philia, that brotherly love, the love of friendship, so to speak. I'm not a real fan of J.B. Phillips' translation of the Bible most of the time, but I think in this instance, the way that Phillips has rendered this interview between Jesus and Peter it captures the emotional import. 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he replied. You know that I am your friend. Then feed my lambs, returned Jesus. Then he said for the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, returned Peter. You know that I am your friend. Then care for my sheep, Jesus replied. Then for the third time, Jesus spoke to him and said, Simon, son of John, are you my friend? Peter was deeply hurt because Jesus' third question to him was, Are you my friend? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I am your friend. Oddly, one is almost reminded of the decidedly modern trope of the would-be romance. One member of the would-be couple so much wants love, albeit in this example of the romantic sort, whereas the other does not feel the same and responds, but we can still be friends. The stuff of dime store novels or made-for-television movies and high school memories. Jesus asks, Peter, are you deeply committed to me, to the purpose to which I have called you? And what is evident is that Peter's response is somewhat less than Jesus might have ideally wanted. And yet, Peter is emotionally hurt when Jesus downgrades his question. So what do we do with this? We might, I suppose, compare ourselves to Peter, just as we could when Peter denied Jesus. We might either say, well, I know I would never have denied Jesus, and I'd have no problem giving Jesus all the agape love he wanted. Or alternatively, we might say, yeah, I guess I'm like Peter. Not quite there yet. Still holding back. Fear, pride, shame, or whatever it is. I, too, am not there yet. But then we must remember, the Gospels are primarily about what Jesus does. We may, I believe, gain at least two spiritual principles from this much-discussed passage. The first is that Jesus is willing to accept us at our present level. Sure, Jesus wanted agape, that all-giving, sacrificial love. Jesus wanted Peter to love him the way that Jesus loved Peter and the others. But it's clear Peter wasn't there yet. So Jesus says, All right, Peter. I'll take your friendship, then. The text would have us believe, I think, that Peter knew there was something more, something he couldn't quite put his finger on, and he felt hurt. But nonetheless, Jesus accepted him, and whatever level of love Peter could give, and so it is, I believe, with us. Jesus will never say to us, not good enough. You don't love me enough. Instead, he will accept us. Take what we have to give, so to speak. And, and there is something else as well, a, a second spiritual point. Each time uh, Peter responded, Jesus also repeated a recurrent refrain, feed my sheep, care for my lambs. As if to say, okay, Peter, you're my friend. Good. Then here's what I need. Here's what I need for you to do. Love those whom I love. Care for those for whom I care. And the history of Peter's life will prove this. Jesus alludes to it at the end of our passage. In doing so, Peter, you're Philia, your brotherly love 
will be transformed into something even greater. With the very actions of caring for those for whom I care, agape will develop. As if Jesus is saying, don't worry, Peter. I take what you can give now, and I know that it will soon blossom into even more. Just take the first step. Feed my lambs. And in the end, you will more than prove your agape. And so it is, I believe, for us. Perhaps it's true. We may be in a place in our lives where we can muster only a little bit of love for Jesus. Just a little bit of commitment to God. But I believe that God will accept that. And what's more, as we live out that love, however little it is, as we care for his lambs, that is, our fellow journeyers in this world, he will cause, in the fullness of time, agape to blossom in our lives, our hearts, and our souls. Mm -hmm.